In half an hour, the ITV chart show featuring Squeeze, Midyore, and Colour Me Bad. That's at 11.25. But now we continue the story of the River Thames. It's only rarely nowadays that the road traffic on Tower Bridge is halted to allow large ships to pass upstream into the Pool of London. great iron bascules are raised, ships have to give 24 hours notice of their arrival. Although electricity has replaced steam power, the permanent staff of the bridge is now too small to keep it operating continuously. But not so long ago, when the old bridge engines still worked, it was ships that had priority. Then there could be a conflict between road and river traffic. Stan Fletcher. The danger that you could have, if there was a stranger coming up, is never a problem. It's always the, the regular one, the one that comes up two or three times a week. They come round the corner, they're flying the signals, they steam on, we open the bridge and they literally, they go through before we finish raising the bridge. And this particular case, it was a small Belgian butler called the Genie. She came round this particular day, we were expecting her. She came batting round the bend. It suddenly went wrong. I don't know, it was something very trivial, but the result was we didn't raise the bridge, or we couldn't raise the bridge straight away. And the boat is steaming on, she's got the tide pushing her up, and all of a sudden she realises, God, we're not moving, you see, so the net result was she went hard, she went astern. Uh, we got the bridge away, and she came through, and of course, we didn't have a radio in those days, just as well, but his megaphone was quite effective uh, about our parentage and various things. He came up the next time, he came batting round the bend and gets the GD. So we whacked the bridge up and he went dead slow. He just burst, he came to a stop and then he crept and he crept all the way up the bridge through the pool. And we got the traffic building up and traffic was very heavy in those days. There were three lines of traffic on the bridge, most of it heavy lorries. And everybody's moaning, moaning at us because we've got the bridge in. But once you put the bridge up, you can't, um, you can't just sort of drop it down. So we're waiting to get a bit closer. So that was sort of one each, but then, you know, we'd, he'd scored and we'd scored. Tower Bridge was built in 1894 as a solution to a problem the Thames had always posed for London. It was a highway for shipping, but a barrier to road traffic. When horse-drawn traffic first trotted over Tower Bridge, a long-running battle between road and river transport was coming to an end. Upstream from Tower Bridge, the Thames has been spanned with road crossings in many places, but it remains a barrier throughout much of its course.
historically the greatest battles over bridges were fought in London. For centuries, London's transport was provided by watermen. They not only took passengers across the river, they took them up and down the Thames, covering several miles. Passengers were picked up from stairs down to the water. It was best to travel on the river, not only because roads were narrow and congested. For more than 500 years, there was only one bridge across the river, Old London Bridge. This stone bridge was completed in 1209 and was a veritable barrier across the river. But with no other river crossings, the watermen had the Thames and much of London's transport to themselves. Chris Elmers of the Museum of London. Well, in the past, if one goes back to the 18th century, there were something like 10,000 watermen at work. And there must have been something like six or 7,000 wherries. These were the very long boats which they used for ferrying passengers up and down and across the river. Most of the work was very much short haul work under skulls. One waterman rowing with a pair of skulls would take you across the river for something like tuppence. If you had to use two watermen rowing under oars, the short hop across the river would probably cost you fourpence around about 1780 to 1800. The wealthy people often actually had their own watermen. They would employ them, they would be given a sort of wage or a salary rather than hired and paid by the job, and they would also provide them with their own wherry. And the wherry and the blaze of the oars would often be painted with the colours of the owners, and the watermen would be fitted out in any colour costume with the badges of the owners. Proposals to build new bridges across the river were opposed by the city, which wanted to keep profits from toll charges, and watermen who feared they'd lose trade. Westminster had the only other crossing that would take carriages, the Lambeth Horse Ferry. The inconvenience of this finally overcame opposition to a new bridge at Westminster, which was opened with great ceremony in 1750. The city knocked down the houses on Old London Bridge to make more room for traffic, and a spate of bridge building followed. Finally, in 1832, Old London Bridge itself was pulled down and replaced by a new bridge. This was disastrous for London's watermen, Chris Elmers. As soon as the old London Bridge has been replaced by new London Bridge in 1831, the old bridge was pulled down in 1832. Very much wider arches than the old bridge had, of course. The whole of the river was now opened up to paddle steamboat travel. Now, these fast steamboats very quickly took away the trade of traveling in a wherry, so they were a major source of competition. The other great damage which they caused, of course, was the wake and the wash. Now, the wash for me, indeed, even a, a, a small paddle steamer, uh, could be very, very hazardous to a small wherry. And there are a number of accidents. Steamboats were still a problem when Bill Brown began work on the river. And my first job was in the skiff, rowing the pool forming about. I'm getting across the water, and I got halfway across, I look down the reach, I see this ship coming up, I thought, what's that? He's got bones in his teeth. That's the front of the ship to wash. Like he's, he's parting the water and he, he causes two big waves. I got frightened. I thought, so this is my life, I'm going to finish up in the suds here. So I started going backwards. That means, like, going astern. So I said, don't go astern. I said, look, look at that ship coming up. I'm not worrying about him, I'm worrying about myself. Keep rowing. So I kept rowing. And how that ship never hit us, I do not know. But he missed us, nearly turned us upside down with his wash. That's the bow, bow wash. I started, but that was the first lesson I learned on the river. If you see a ship, remember, keep rowing. Right, son, our next port of call, Tarpia. I was just going past Traitor's Gate, and all of a sudden, bang! He said, what the? 
bloody hell's that? I said, don't look at me. And I'm rowing. Fool said, I'm going to jump out of this boat in a minute. I'm not having much more. Bang! Another one. He bowled that one overboard. I don't know where he jumped. I know he sat on the bottom of the boat. And I'm still row. I can't move. I've got to row the boat. He don't help me. I'm still rowing. Bang! Gosh, I've something up with too much of this. I'm going to jump in the drink in a minute. Rowan. And eventually, after about, I don't know how many bangs, and big black smoke all over the place, we finished at Tower Pier. I said, but what's that noise, darling? He said, it's all right, son, it's only the Queen's birthday, and they're firing so many gun salute. They might have told us, mightn't they? The Bacon's work, and I. <laughs> And that was the end of that. The paddle steamers did provide commuter services from the Victorian era until earlier this century. But they couldn't compete with railways and roads and survived only as pleasure steamers. In the age of the motor car, the river was forgotten. Better river crossings became the obsession. As road traffic grew, London's 18th and 19th century bridges were replaced. This is the old suspension bridge at Lambeth. In the 1920s, the demolition of the 19th century Waterloo Bridge began. From the time all these bridges had first been built, watermen and bargemen had protested that they'd make navigation of the river more difficult. And the bridges did. Ships going upstream of Tower Bridge needed folding funnels. The opening of New Lambeth Bridge in 1932 was good news for road traffic, but not for tugs. All bridges affected the flow of the tidal currents on the river. Tug skipper Bob Harris. And I remember very, very vividly because uh, it frightened the life out of me. I, and I didn't really realise what was happening at the time. I was coming down very late on the tide from Brentford and I came to Vauxhall Bridge. Well, normally there at Vauxhall Bridge, the set of tide is hard to the south. And you hold the, the, the tug up to the northern abutment to, to allow for the tug, the tide to take the craft through the bridge safely. But on this occasion, I held them up hard to the uh, northern and nearly carried the bridge away. And I was very concerned about this. I just managed to get these craft through. So when I got home, I visited my, my father, who I knew had uh, done a lot of driving under all through that bridge, and I asked him what on earth had happened there. Well, he said, don't you know, he said, there are three distinct sets of tide at Foxhall Bridge. He said, uh, on the, on the, just on, in the first hour or so, he said it's heart of the southern. But then he said, as the tide drops, so it, 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 it tends to come away from the hard shore at Nine Elms. And so the half ebb, you get a straight shoot through. But later on, he said, the tide hits that hard shore even harder. And he said, you get that set to the north. That's just a little example of the difficulties that uh, London Tugman had getting their craft home. The biggest ships that had to negotiate London's bridges were the colliers that brought coal from the northeast up to power stations and gas works at Fulham, Battersea and Wandsworth. They had to catch the tide just right to get through the lowest bridges. A London waterman would act as a bridge or mud pilot, Frank Wilson. Coming down to Westminster, you would look at the bridge and for all purposes, you wouldn't think it would get through because seeing the bridge is very narrow and there wasn't much of an archway, you would uh, get to it and uh, then you would see the ship as you're going full speed to go down in the water, which would take all the water out of the bridge hole. It would drop about a foot to 18 inches, go under the bridge, then you would see it rise again as you got through. When going up to uh, Fulham Power Station for a collier down, tides were predictable at a certain time, but you never knew if they was right. If they was late, you was afraid that the tide would probably build up quickly, so you had to go off full speed down. And you would watch each bridge you came to 
the uh, marks on the bridge so you would be all right at uh, Westminster. When you got to Battersea, you would have to uh, make sure that you had height at Westminster, otherwise you couldn't stop anywhere else. The bridges were a hazard too for lightermen steering their barges on the tides. Though there were compensations, Bill Brown. The first bridge you come to was Tower Bridge. They didn't have raised no bridges for you then, they just used to throw tin cans at you or something like that. Tower Bridge was the worst bridge of the lot, because you get all the scallywags going over. But London Bridge, all the gentry used to walk over that, going to work, to and from work. And if it was windy, your luck might be in. You'd see a gnat come flying over the bridge, land in the barge. You'd jump down on a quick, see if it fitted you, especially if it was a good trilby. If it fitted, you'd pull it back, and the bloke would be waving his hands out, where's me at? In the water, mate, sorry. Well, if it didn't fit, you'd say, well, I'm going to Battersea, so the man get his hat back. I'm going up to Membrane Gardens at Hammersmith, or Battersea. Go up there if you want your hat, it'd be on board the barge. And we used to get, I don't know, four or five hats, I have at one side. If we couldn't, if they didn't fit me, I'd flog them. You'd get half a crown and a good hat. Though London's watermen lost out in the end to road traffic, they haven't disappeared altogether. Bob and Paul Prentice now run pleasure boats on the Thames. Watermen are still the experts on the toing and froing of the river's treacherous tides. And Bob continues a long tradition as a royal waterman. The Royal Barge was last rowed by Waterman in 1919 at a peace pageant to commemorate the end of the Great War. Whenever Her Majesty the Queen travels on the Thames today, she's attended by her barge master and some of the Royal Watermen. They have no rowing to do. They're there as a colourful reminder of the time when watermen provided London's chief form of transport. the Thames has been London's lifeline, but it's a barrier as well. The last downstream bridge is the Tower Bridge. Eastward of that, the last road crossing, is the Blackwall Tunnel in the heart of London's East End, where its continuous traffic must thread away through many miles of congested streets. Downstream of Tower Bridge, there was always too much shipping and the Thames was too wide to bridge. The solution was to tunnel under the river. The famous engineers, the Brunels, solved the technical problems in the 19th century, but their own tunnel never carried road traffic. It's now used by trains on the East London line. The Dartford Tunnel was built in the 1950s. Engineer Tony Howard. In those days, it was in the middle of nowhere. I actually worked in an office in Essex, but although I lived in Dartford here. So every morning I would uh, be brought in a minibus to the site, would come down here, cross the river on a launch to go to work. And uh, many afternoons I remember how the boatman would ring us up from the jetty in Essex and ring us up in our site office and say, I'm leaving in 15 minutes, and you've got to be down there and get back across the river, else <coughs> you might be stranded. And uh, if the fog did come up, of course, it was dangerous. The ships were OK. They were going full, stream, full steam ahead down the river with their radar working, and we were trying to pick a way between them. But as we went into the tunnel, we had to go through airlocks. When we came out, of course, we had to be decompressed, rather like uh, divers have to be decompressed, uh, else you get the bends. In the face there, we have these miners working. Now, in those days at Dartford, the mechanism was very much less than it might be today. And we had miners actually using pneumatic clay spades. 
every piece of chalk in this tunnel, a mile long and about 30 feet in diameter, was won by a man with a clay spade. And he worked hard. And of course, the water poured out around him, and he was wet. He could wear oilskins, but there was no way that he could stop being wet. For two years, boardings have gone on from both sides of the river. Now, only a few feet separated them. For the 400 men who have worked on the project, it was a day they'd longed for. Down here, air pressure must be kept at about 25 pounds above the normal to prevent water from pouring in. From the Kent side, boring had already reached the meeting place. Here on the Essex side, a few feet more, and they were through. It was considerable satisfaction for the men and an engineering triumph. Only experts know how a tunnel, starting from opposite sides, meets in the middle. But it would be embarrassing if it didn't. As the chalk has been dug out, the tunnel, 28 feet in diameter, has been lined with steel. 34,000 tons of it by the time the job's done. Greatly relieving traffic, the tunnel will be a roadway under the river, 15 miles downstream from London. The Dartford Tunnel now carries the heavy traffic of the M25 motorway. It's financed by toll charges, as London's bridges used to be. But it can't cope with the rising tide of lorries and cars, and a bridge is being built to relieve the traffic jams. The new Dartford Bridge sweeps over the Thames at a height which will allow what shipping survives to ride upriver on the highest tides. It's the latest chapter in the long saga of the competing interests of road and river traffic. Though it's been tunnelled under and bridged many times, the Thames still flows serenely for most of its length, a silent highway, a frontier and a barrier. To cross it, you need a bridge or a ferry. At Twickenham in Middlesex, the old way of getting from one bank to the other still survives. This is Hamilton's Ferry, modernised only by an outboard motor, still providing a way across without a road or a tunnel or a bridge. once regarded as outmoded, are now a pleasure for day trippers and a shortcut for school children. Next Sunday, the River Thames begins at 11.25.